This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. Welcome to the Mississippi Arts Hour. I'm Malcolm White. I'm your host today. And this is a very special edition of the Arts Hour, uh, as it is our 12th anniversary on Mississippi Public Broadcasting. On October the 5th, 2008, we moved this fledgling radio show over from WLEZ Community Radio in Jackson, which uh, we had been broadcasting since 2005, uh, over to uh, MPB Think Radio in 2008, and we have been right here for 12 years, and a total of 15 years of long-form interviews featuring artists uh, and art supporters uh, all across the state of Mississippi and beyond to honor the great arts tradition uh, in Mississippi. My guest today is a Mississippian based in Nashville, Chelsea Lovett. Chelsea is uh, a Southern writer, a multi-instrumentalist, a singer, and a traveling performer. Welcome to the show, Chelsea Lovett. Thanks, Malcolm. Good to be here. So you are, uh, you're in Nashville, is that right? I am. But I you're am. from Hattiesburg. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I grew up in the Hub City and uh, supposedly the birthplace of rock and roll, some would say. Right. Uh, I've seen the marker. Yeah, yeah. They say uh, the Mississippi Juke Band, I'm not sure what year it was, but supposedly this band recorded a song, one of the first songs in the style of rock and roll on Mobile Street in a studio kind of before many things were, were being recorded and whatnot uh, in that style. But, you know, everybody, everybody claims it. Memphis does, New Orleans, you know, it, uh, I mean, it, it all really just comes from, from Africa. So that's right. Yeah. And, and we just, uh, stylized it and took advantage of it and sure. made a made an industry out of it Indeed. but uh, for, for our listeners who don't know uh hattiesburg very well mobile street is right in the heart of the african-american business district of downtown hattiesburg there's also a, a wonderful museum there african-american military museum uh, mm -hmm. and it does tell the story uh, of music and arts uh, that came from from the hub city. So, uh, Chelsea, you, uh, you grew up uh, in Hattiesburg. Did you uh, go to the uh, school? Did you go to elementary school uh, there in Hattiesburg? Yep. yep, went to public school, went to Hattiesburg High School, and graduated from there. Went to Tim's Elementary, uh, Rowan, Lily Burney. Um, I think they built a new school, and, and yeah, finished at Hattiesburg High. And, uh, went on to, to Millsaps College in Jackson. So got to spend four years there. What years were you uh, at Millsaps? I'm just curious so about sort of my time in Jackson and your time here. Yeah, yeah, 2004 to 2008. When oh, okay. I was at Millsaps. Okay. Yeah, and um, yeah, it was cool. You know, Fondren was kind of just picking up. And um, I mean, we were kind of in this bubble you know, they say Millsaps is a liberal bubble in many ways. But, um, yeah, I mean, I grew up going to Jackson, too. My mom uh, is from there, and um, we'd go to the old-time deli and get gingerbread yeah. gumbo. And, um, but, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, Millsaps, you know, it's kind of a blur. It's longer uh, in the past than, you, than you'd think. It creeps up on you. So you... You're much younger than most of the people who I'm going to list here, but I just am curious if you have any recollection uh, of this uh, list of musicians and performers who were based in Hattiesburg during the, really the 70s, uh, when I was in school at USM. You, you must be familiar with Webb Wilder because he's in Nashville and you can't possibly have not met him both being from Hattiesburg. Sure, I know, I know the credo. Okay. Uh, Omar, Omar Dykes of Omar and the Howlers. You remember them? 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Howlers, um, you know, R.S. Field is who I know from that that group. And when I was, was uh, in school with uh, R.S. Field, his name was Crow. And yeah. And he was actually the drummer uh, in the Howlers. Yep, yep. Uh, uh, Susie Elkins. Yeah, you know, that's a name. Uh, it, it is a name uh, I know. I, I'm not, I don't know her personally but um uh yeah that she was what seven late seven eighties yeah she uh and uh webb were in a band together well several bands one was called the ever ready brothers um another one was called the drapes which i think rs field was also a member of and then they all moved out to austin together uh mm -hmm. there at the late 70s early 80s including Omar and the Howlers, Webb, Susie, uh, the whole bunch. Uh, Kerry Hudson uh, is a, a guy who is in and out of the Summerall, Hattiesburg area. You know Kerry? Oh, yeah. I know Kerry Hudson. I, um, I, I you know, at, at Millsaps at Hattiesburg, I mean, I, I think when I started playing music, well, I worked at it. My first job was at a music store in Hattiesburg at the time. It was called Mississippi Music. And they hired, you know, seven, I, don't, I was 16 or 17, and we had the work release program with school and high school, and I was, you know, happy to get out and then go <laughs> work. And, uh, yeah, it was great. I mean, it was, you know, I got to sell guitars and sell. That's back when they had Ticketmaster, and, you know, all the guys, I think they hired a, you know, ambitious bright-eyed 16-year-old to come open up the shop on Saturdays because they were all too hungover. <laughs> would line up, you know, from this is back before, you know, uh, the internet really was the, the, the deciding factor of concerts and all that. But yeah, there was, a, we were the Ticketmaster venue. We'd have, you know, all kinds of, every Saturday there was a show for sale. So I'd have to deal with those people. But, um, yeah, uh, the, the point of that, I guess, was um, that that was, uh, that was, yeah, the, 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 that was my introduction with, um, you know, wanting to do music. There was a recording studio in, in the shop. Pretty cool. Um, so so when did you start playing? Uh my first instrument was violin. I played, I did fiddle violin for two years and quit to go play soccer. And I was terrible at soccer. I was totally uncoordinated. And, uh, the, I, my, the teacher begged my parents to not let me quit. And they were like, well, she's going to do what, she's, what she wants to do. So from there, I started playing guitar and uh, I took um, opera lessons, actually, from a guy named... Bob Mesrobian, and he taught um, a girl named Lacey Shaw Bear, who was in that show Party of Five, and um, he was an interesting character. I mean, I, I feel like that was a real foundation of, uh, you know, voice and, and learning how to control it, and uh, he had a really interesting technique, and I think he smoked a pack a day, but still could had a range, you know, it was pretty amazing, and he was think if i'm not mistaken i think he was the original um you know fiddler on the roof like the if i were oh yeah that, that character he i think he was the original one on broadway so i mean just yeah to answer your question i mean i think my first gig was when i was working at that music store and they'd all sneak me in bars this is when the thirsty hippo was still at the older building and uh, still, in my opinion, one of the coolest venues I've, I've seen. But I started playing like open mics there around 16. Right. Did you did you play uh, when you were at Millsaps in Jackson? Or did yeah, you play music I, I'd, I'd, play, I'd play Finian sometimes. And, um, you know, I was, I was in the studious age of life and studying English, not sure what I wanted to do supposed to go to law school and all that um but yeah i play i played with a guy named stan black and i haven't talked to him in years 
but yeah, I guess to answer the whole full circle, as I dig digress, Carrie Hudson would come. I, I knew Carrie from when I was working at that music store, and so he was um, he was playing in Jackson a lot then, and uh, real cool. And was just he went to Millsaps too, and um, yeah, it was just always encouraging about you know writing songs and whatnot, and um, and yeah, the the story goes is he. I moved to New Orleans um, after moving to Nashville, teaching English in France, went back to Mississippi for a year, um, and then ended up in New Orleans. And Carrie and I were living in the French Quarter at the same time. And um, I don't know who told me about some artist apprenticeship that the Mississippi Arts Commission was doing or how that idea came about, but Harry and I were going to do it, and uh, we got we got the grant. Um, but <laughs> you know that that's how this all started, I guess. But um, yeah, C Carrie's uh, it was like a songwriting mentorship, you know. And it's a funny story, you know. I, I, uh, basically, I think a girlfriend got mad. <laughs> Carrie was giving me <laughs> on the porch some. <laughs> You know, and like Carrie's like a, you know, he was father figure, like just, you know, cool, no, 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 no nothing remotely along those lines. But yeah, I think Carrie was living with a girlfriend who was pissed or something. So we ended up, I don't know, not, not finishing it. But the, the Arts Commission, they were cool because, um, you know, that, that didn't necessarily, we didn't follow through, but they ended up giving me another grant to go, um, study music in Scotland and they paid for me to do a course on Scottish traditional music and I argued that you know all the you know to, to really understand songwriting and, and where the foundation of it sort of is is with these folk songs and whatnot and um, so yeah it was pretty cool I got to go to Glasgow and do this adult course in Scottish traditional music and um, worked with a really I, I think I met the, the guy that wrote the score for that movie for Brave and was working with Pixar and whatnot in a whiskey bar there. But yeah, so it's just been a whirlwind, you know, and um, uh, yeah, from there, um, just I, I, I can't say how, um, can't say enough how, how pivotal um, the, the Mississippi Arts Commission has been um, and just helping out, you know, just little things like that with, with getting that tiny grant that, that paid for the course. And then, you know, um, uh, they, they were just really, really, uh, they were cool about, about all of it. And, and um, I think I was trying to apply for the, the big grant, the artist grant. And they said, you know, well, you should apply for this one, you know, maybe, maybe hang out way to gear, you know, and, and uh, there's kind of somebody maybe already in line for it, you know, so. And I think they alternated with visual arts and music and whatnot. But, I mean, I couldn't believe that, that uh, I received the, the artist grant back in 2016. Yeah, so I guess it's more linear when you look back on it. Hi, I'm Malcolm White. Thanks for listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast. You can also hear the show on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. For access to more conversations with creative Mississippians, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcast app. Hi, I'm Walt Grayson. You can now listen to the wild, weird, and wonderful stories of Mississippi with Mile Marker. Some of the big names that travel up and down the highways, obviously Elvis and Johnny Cash, and you have Jerry Lee Lewis, Carl Perkins. Join me as we hit the roads of Mississippi on Mile Marker. Johnny Cash suggested that Carl write a song called Blue Suede Shoes that was all kind of created with Aaron Amory. You can listen by going to mpbonline.org slash radio or by using your favorite podcasting app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Welcome back to the Mississippi Arts Hour. I'm Malcolm White with the Arts Hour hosting duties today. My special guest is calling in from Nashville, Tennessee, though she is a native of Hattiesburg, Mississippi, 
Welcome back, Chelsea Lovett. Thanks, Malcolm. Chelsea has a brand new debut album that uh, is just out. I'll let her describe it a little bit for you. It's called You Have Your Cake, So Lie In It. Uh, and uh, it is your first record. And you were telling a story in the first segment that a grant from the Arts Commission uh, made made that possible. So you actually, it sounds like, had multiple interactions with the Arts Commission, the apprenticeship with Carrie Hudson, which I remember, uh, and then the trip to uh, Scotland for the uh, singer-songwriter. Was it a festival or a workshop? It was a workshop. It was a class they were doing. And um, I wanted to go to music school. Uh, you know, uh, that was kind of after Millsaps and being in Nashville for a year. And um, I, I wanted to go study in London and, you know, lay on the steps of Abbey Road and try to talk to Miles or George, you know, George Mark's son. Um, but, uh, yeah, I was just trying – the graduate schools in, in, in London, um, there was one Goldsmiths and a couple others. Bobby Field wrote me some recs and um, recommendations there, uh, very warm, kind recommendations to go to those schools. And I was accepted, but they don't give scholarships to those. So it was like, you know, 40 grand to go for a year and – um, you know, I found that I was just kind of looking for programs and things just to further some education of music and theory and whatnot and, and, and songwriting. And that was that was there. And, and, and uh, it was through the Royal Conservatory, Scotland. They offered a summer program and it was short. I mean, I think it was just like two weeks, you know, but it was an intensive course and you pick your focus and. Um, it was really cool. It was really cool. To, and we, we did sessions. You know, you go to these jams and bars, you know, uh, they call them sessions. And yeah. uh, beautiful experience. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't know if it made me a better songwriter or not, but um, I learned, I think I learned the Nashville number system over there. So. <laughs> you want to explain to our listeners what the Nashville number system is? Well, it's kind of a central, uh, I was in a session actually fairly recently and you learn that it, how important it is in a studio in terms of communicating with everybody there. But, um, you know, the one, four, five, you, you, you basically, you know, you have your key and then you, you pick the one there's intervals in relationships in terms of how you change from one to the other that um, that make a song feel a certain way. And songwriting is essential, uh, or this is essential for songwriting. Blues, you know, you've got one, four, five. A lot of, uh, a lot of songs you hear are the one, four, five, you know, sort of. So you learned this while you were over uh, in Scotland at the... Uh at the workshop. Yeah, yeah. The you know, you learn the six minor and and um, the three sometimes uh, create when you go back to the one, uh, you know, things like that. That for songwriting at least, it, it kind of um, yeah. I think I think that's that's kind of the key with it. Um, and and figuring out what makes a song a hit. Well, I think it evokes an emotion with people and you can usually hear you know you can listen to a record and hear what that song might be what what their single might be and i think often it's when it's been well thought out in terms of how those intervals and trend and transitions i guess uh relate to one another but um and it's essential in in, in you know communicating in a studio and 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 when you're charting your songs and you're teaching a band your songs, you know, if you can give them your charts, then things go a lot more smoothly. So. Well, tell us a little bit about the record. Uh, you had your cake. Uh, is it a concept? Is it a, you think started, of it as uh, stories in a short story book? It started out that way. And, um, you know, I ended up taking a job as uh, th this all happened kind of, 
I knew I wanted to do a record. I put out a small EP in 2015 that was fairly amateur, and I didn't know what I was doing. I was just putting something out, and ha- I mean, they're all original songs. Um, on that one, called it was called Mossy Stone, but um, I, I knew I wanted a full record, a, a full length uh, record, and um, yeah, I was after doing that Scottish traditional music course. I ended up. Um, wanted to stay over there and I had some friends in France I had taught English over there a couple years before that and so I was playing uh, some gigs there actually and then um, ended up getting a nanny job God help me uh, that was a pretty sweet deal and I had this tiny apartment in Paris you know and um, I was trying to live this artist you know starving artist's life and um, sort of, you know, uh, just drinking wine and, uh, you know, such vibing on concepts and, um, reading a lot of John Keats. And, um, anyway, I was just thinking about, all right, well, if you make it, you know, like we're all striving for this, this goal, this thing of making it and whatnot. Well, what, what happens when you do, you know, when you're at the top, like the, you know, do you feel bored? You know, is is it more fun to kind of be in this state of not quite being there, you know? And so I thought of the phrase, can't have your cake and eat it too. Then you made your bed, so line it and just kind of combined them. And um, so it's, it's a mashup. It's a mashup. <laughs> the whole record. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, so um, I was over there and I was broke as hell, and um, I, I responded to a Craigslist ad for a guy that needed English native tongue vocals on some demos, 25 euro an hour, and I emailed the guy, and I said, hey, I'm your girl, man. I got, I'm from Mississippi, and um, I got this record, you know, this Mossy Stone thing, and um here it is. Uh, I'd love to, to get paid 25 euro an hour to do some vocal work, you know, and he got back to me immediately and we met and um, his name is Marco Tavi and he's from Corsica and um, is he was a pivotal part of this record and ended up um, we, we, we got together. We worked we I think we worked out one song in the studio after that. He said that he'd already done those demos and that was long gone, but he listened to my record and he, he really liked what he heard. And so um, we were the same age and just passionate about Rolling Stones records and stuff. So anyway, uh, we, long story short, Mark came over to Nashville, uh, got uh, a studio later, but we wrote, we got nine songs done in a week. So that's it. That's wow. You have it. But and and there's, there's a lot of styles involved, too, right? A lot sure. of different styles. Rockabilly, yeah. straight up country, a little bit of bluegrass. Yep, yep. We, you know, it was cool to, I, I would write, I wrote the songs and, you know, I'd have basic scratch demos and I'd send, send them to Mark because I came back over here when I got the grant and, um, and I'd send, you know, the, just the scratch songs and, you know, we'd say, well, this has got to be Blonde on Blonde, you know. Um, so, and that's the idea and concept we would go for in terms of sound for the particular song. And uh, the, set, the, the song, the other song that I've chosen to do uh, on this, this session is called State of Denial. And I'd say that's the best example of, uh, of the Blonde on Blonde attempt or goal with the record um uh in terms of you know that sort of laid back smoky snare um you know soul sound it's, it's got a soul uh in uh well foundation i guess um so yeah um there's you know big start sort of aspirations and and sort of the memphis influence there too um throughout the record but yeah i mean it's it's an interesting uh flow but i feel like it tells a story in a certain way and it's at least not boring 
Hi, I'm Malcolm White. Thanks for listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast. You can also hear the show on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. For access to more conversations with creative Mississippians, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcast app. Hi, I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. On the original Southern Remedy, we answer questions about all aspects of your health and share some of the latest medical information in the news. You can listen to the show on Wednesdays at 11 on MPB Think Radio, or you can subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on your preferred podcasting app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Welcome back to the Mississippi Arts Hour. Malcolm White here with my special guest, Chelsea Lovett, with us today. Chelsea lives in Nashville, Tennessee, singer, songwriter, multi-instrumentalist, uh, traveling troubadour, uh, and good spirit all around. Chelsea has a debut record out uh, entitled, You Have Your Cake, So Lie In It. And Chelsea, if I understand correctly, this was your third grant you got from the Mississippi Arts Commission to make the record. That's right. The, that that was the doozy, the big one. Um, yeah, I, I was I was in I was actually uh, in in France trying to live there, and I um, I had met my guitar player Mark Otavi there in, in in Paris when I was broke doing a small tour and um, playing some shows, seeing some old friends, and um, we just. Uh, there was a collaboration there and, and I, I wanted to do a record and I'd applied for the grant. I didn't expect to get it, but I was in the process of trying to find a way to stay in Paris. Cause I, I liked the, uh, you know, the whole artist, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the artist that smokes cigarettes and drinks coffee and writes, you know, a manifesto or something, uh, yeah. but, you know, so, but I got I, I got an email that I'd gotten the grant and um, lots of different things kind of were pointing to get back to the states. We want to do music and um, and do it. Uh, this is kind of where it's at um, in the music hubs and whatnot. So anyway, that's kind of I, I came back over and we still collaborated for I guess. Well, it was like a year after that. I was still in New Orleans and then ended up moving to Nashville 2016. And a couple of my friends and bands here, uh, I knew that I wanted to do it on tape and find an analog situation. And um, several friends recommended um, the bomb shelter. And um, Andrea Tokik is a genius. And um, he was a pivotal part in this record. RS also was a guide in all of it. And he had, I, I told him when I got the grant um, and he suggested going to Royal studios in Memphis and working with Boo Mitchell, you know, and we were looking at pretty pricey situations and whatnot, but um, I had, I had something to work with, you know, and, and Andrea um, really gave me a great deal. We, we had some session players and we got nine songs done in a week. And um, I had uh, a guy named Carl Saff do the mastering because he's known to master for vinyl. And I never really intended for it to be on vinyl uh, or that that would be the progress or the, the, the progression of it. Um, you know, I uh, was shopping it to, you know, labels and all that industry stuff, working with the manager for a minute. And then... Um, things kind of shifted with, with a lot of digital stuff and, and people were kind of doing it themselves. And anyway, there's just, there's a label out of Knoxville and it's called Fat Elvis and I was people and, you know, sending the record out saying, this is what I got. Um, I'd like to put it out and uh, have some help behind it, mainly just trying to get help to pay for CDs and, you know, that kind of stuff. And, this guy did vinyl, and um, he really liked it, and 
you know, wanted to make it his 10th um, tenth record, and it was their first full length to put out, Fat Elvis. So it was their 10th edition and first full length. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it, it, I, did, I did it in a weird way. I, I released it on vinyl, just vinyl, and I saw it as a way to sort of shop it around and um, had a release party for vinyl you know, for my vinyl release, and then um, waited to do it digitally, you know, and uh, Nashville scene has been really kind, and um, they've given me a lot of great write-ups on the record and, and support there, and uh, I think, I had, yeah, the first release party was at the American Legion here in Nashville, and um, post-82, and um, so we did that, and then and we did it on Elvis's birthday, um, and then I waited a year and was still trying to, you know, find a dream record label. It would be, I personally think Fat Possum would be a great label to, uh, release anything on, um, being it, uh, it being so concentrated in Mississippi. But, um, yeah, it kind of got to that point where I was like, I just need to get this out, you know, yeah. and worked with, uh, a, a Big Hassle Media, uh, really, you know, kind publicist. Everybody's just been really helpful in, in working with uh, a broke musician trying to just <laughs> along the way. And it's just been, you know, uh, I'm like, I guess, a cat that jumps off a ledge and I end up landing on my feet somehow with all of it. But, yeah, um, so I just decided to release it and... I, you know, uh, we, we had the whole release schedule. It's a crazy process getting, you know, uh, singles out and all that and press for it. And, um, but yeah, and, and, you know, we, we did the release party at my favorite venue in Nashville. It's called the Mercy Lounge. And I had been seeing shows there for, uh, years, you know, and, um, so that went well, the release party. And then we, I released it February 28th, and then the week after that, um, a tornado hit East Nashville, and then uh, we were we had a pandemic on our hands. The world changed. So, yeah, yeah. How, how has that affected uh, your day to day life uh, in terms of touring and performing? I guess you've had to go uh, sort of virtual and and start doing all of your shows. Uh, yeah, via I, the I, internet. I've been bad about doing live streams. Um, I actually did my first live stream in Hattiesburg at T Bones, T Bones Records. T Bones yeah. Records. This, oh yeah. This representing here, um, my homies there. I, I love those guys. Um, I did that, and uh, it's called Live from a Safe Distance. And um, I really, uh, I can't say um, enough. Uh, nice things about Toby, Toby Barker, who, um, has done such great things for Hattiesburg and is so cool. And, the mayor of Hattiesburg. Yes. Yeah. And he was involved in getting that live stream going, but yeah, I mean, it's like you release a record and then you have a tour, you have lots of, you got a tour on that record. And I had months of tours out West and I had showcases for South by Southwest, you know, canceled. And, um, I guess the one thing I'm good at is getting grants because I, <laughs> I end up uh, use cares. You know, I just uh, all my musician friends in Nashville at the beginning of this, before people started collecting unemployment, um, they everybody was just rushing to get these grants. Music cares had a grant, um, a COVID grant, and then um, I recently just um, it was like, uh, yeah. I, beginning of September, I got a grant from NSAI or the, the writers foundation. And that was sponsored by Sony and that's helped out a lot. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's changed everything. It's, it's been, uh, depressing yet also, um, kind of a, a time maybe, uh, I personally needed to just kind of reset and, and I've, I've been so busy with so much, um, and I, I couldn't remember a time where I could sit and read a book, you know, and I think for yeah. many musicians, it's been a time to kind of reassess and, and um, 
just write and, and work on more material. And uh, I hope I'm, I'm, I've got a new concept, I, you know, that uh, I hope to have in the works next year by the time, hopefully next year is, hopefully by the time things are back to normal, we'll see. Yep. But, uh, so, so it sounds like this uh, uh, degree and education you got at Millsaps in literature and writing has paid off through all this grant writing that you're doing. Oh, sure, sure. I, mean, I still have a ton of student loan debt, but, you know, <laughs> I just like, you know, pretend. I'm hoping maybe one day, uh, you know, I could appeal to uh, somebody in some capacity and get some forgiveness. But, you know, I've been one of those scatterbrained, you know, idiots just trying to um, uh, uh, navigate all this and pretending like they don't exist, which isn't really good for your credit. But, um, yeah, I mean, Millsaps is totally, t I mean, that that's where you learn to write. The Millsaps, I remember that they always said that you learn how to think there. And it's true. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a diamond in the rough institution. Uh, I had a wonderful education there. And I've always been a writer. I've always, you know, it's just a natural thing to just write pages in a, in a notebook and a diary and, and, you know, and then songs, songwriting and um, it's a kind of different animal in many ways. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been pivotal, it, you know. Um, I think Do you have... Do you have a writing routine? Uh, do you write every day? Do you have a regiment, or do you just sort of write when you feel like it? You know, I guess when I realized I could be a songwriter, is sometimes it, it is a craft, and you have to work on it, and and it's something. It's a process, a learning process, and and you're never there, you know. But I think that. Um, I mean, you'll wake up sometimes with an idea in the middle of the night and you got to make, yeah, you got to make yourself get out of bed and write down the idea. I have thousands of voice memos that I just, I go back to them and I'm like, what is this? What was I thinking on this? You know, so you really need to try to execute. And, and some of the, my favorite songs I've written, I've done in 10 minutes. Um, you know, a lot of songs happen that way. The, title track for this record it took me a year to write because I had so much ambition for it you know and um we yeah we ended up using a melody that Mark uh and his friend actually had kind of developed but yeah I'd say in terms of a writing regimen um I try to just have some sort of idea a new idea that occurs every day and the artist way is a good thing uh if you I've done that before where you get up, first thing you do in the morning, you just write three pages, you know, just three pages. Doesn't matter what it is, but, you know, um, I think in my best times of, of really um, sitting down and doing it, uh, that that's helped. But, yeah, you know, um, uh, in terms of a regimen, it's kind of what I'm working on this month since I received that grant and trying to spend two hours just sitting down and working on music theory and stuff like that. I also play fiddle and I've picked that, I picked it back up three years ago. So I've been implementing that and, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you're working on a new record now, huh? Well, I'm marinating on concept. This is the, the early stages marinate yeah. before cooking. Yeah, yeah, we, we have a pretty uh, hefty vinyl collection here in my house, and um, trying to just listen to the stuff that is good and what I like, and, um, you know, I, it, I think it kind of starts with a, with a riff and a, a dystopian spaghetti western sort of, uh, you know, uh, Marconi concept is what I'm toying around with for the next oh, one. okay. Okay something sort of representational of these times. Hi, I'm Malcolm White. Thanks for listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast. You can also hear the show on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. 
for access to more conversations with creative Mississippians, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcast app. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app.